Well, good morning. We are glad that you are with us. I know that we have some visitors, and we are thankful for your presence, and we want you to be back every time that you have the chance. This last week, I was able to go up and be a part of Bible Camp as a counselor, and I got to tell you, our kids are great, something that I already knew but was confirmed by my interaction with them over the, this last week, and it was a wonderful opportunity and experience to be a counselor and interact with so many of our young people, and I'm so proud of them and of the great Christian example that they set while we were at camp. It's good to be with you this morning. We are continuing our series over marriage and family, and our topic this morning is marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I want you to imagine with me for just a moment a disease that claims one million lives a year. Now this is a fictitious disease, but I want to make this point before we launch into our sermon. If there was a disease in our country that caused one million people a year to die, I believe that the CDC and our federal government would expend billions of dollars to try and determine what the nature of this disease was and come up with some drug so that they could treat it or some sort of cure so that they could help people who were suffering and ultimately dying with this horrible disease. And I say that because there are somewhere around one million divorces in our nation every year. As I stated last week, when the family starts to fall apart, so does the society. So does the society. And so the question emerges, why is it that our nation does not do more to help people with their marriages? I'm very thankful that the state of Tennessee has offered a discount to those who go through premarital counseling in the sense that they are able to get their marriage license for free if they will go in and sit down and talk with a counselor about their marriage for a four hour period of time. I'm thankful that our state is doing that. But as far as the divorce epidemic that we see in our society and sadly the divorce epidemic that we sometimes see in the church, very little is done to combat this problem. Now the reason is untold millions of dollars change hands every year as a result of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I mean, you think about it. A man and a woman decide that they want to divorce. And all of a sudden you have to go out and hire attorneys and pay retaining fees and you have to pay court costs. And then if they sell the property that they own, they have to hire a real estate agent and then they have to pay taxes. And so this thing that is known as marriage, divorce, and remarriage in our society is a multi-million dollar industry. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but I had an instructor at one of my universities who made this point that if this sort of epidemic was a physical epidemic in the sense that it caused disease, death, dying, and pain, we would do something about it. But by and large, our society turns a blind eye to this topic. And so I think it's important that the church is not like the proverbial ostrich that buries its head in the sand and just ignores everything that is going on around it. I tell you, at times it might very well be easier to not deal with some of the more difficult biblical topics that we talk about. Difficult in the sense of how it impacts people, not difficult in the sense of how it is spelled out in God's Word because I believe it's very understandable by those who approach it in an honest sort of fashion. And so we're going to look at this topic in the book of Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, tempting him, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, this may sound a bit ridiculous, but Matthew chapter 19 follows Matthew chapter 18. And I think the Holy Spirit had a reason for putting a chapter on forgiveness prior to a chapter where Jesus talks about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Because I think marriages need to be places where there is forgiveness. And sometimes when I talk with couples who are conflicted and we talk about the one who owed the 10,000 talents versus the servant who owed a very small sum of money, 
I tell them in that parable, I am the man who owes the 10,000 talents. Which one are you? And if we're honest with ourselves, we're always the 10,000 talent man. And so marriage is an area where there needs to be forgiveness. You're going to make mistakes. There will be times when your mate may not like you very much. They may just say, you know, I just can't even look at you right now because of what you have done. I'm so angry. But at the same time, there needs to be forgiveness in that type of relationship. This was an insincere question that they are asking Jesus. The text told us just a moment ago, if you look back, it says that they were tempting him. And so they thought they were going to entrap Jesus as they did so many times throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus. There were basically two rabbinical schools of thought by two rabbis, one named Hillel and the other one named Shammai. And basically Hillel held what we might term as being a liberal view on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And the way that I remember it is because there are so many L's in Hillel's name. He had a liberal view. And he believed that a man could divorce his wife for just any reason. If she burned the toast, if there was something about her that you did not like, if she was a bad cook, you could put her away. That was his idea of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And Hillel, by and large, sounds like a lot of people in our society today. And then there was another rabbinical school of thought led, led by a rabbi named Shammai. And Shammai believed that you could only put away your wife for the most serious of causes. There had to be some sort of uncleanliness in her before you could put her away. And so the Pharisees on this occasion believed that they would either trap Jesus between those who followed after the teachings of Hillel or those who followed after the teaching of Shammai. And there's another thing that we might add to this. It could have also have been intended as a political trap. John the Immerser had just been beheaded by Herod because he told Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. In Matthew 14, verses 3 through 10, where Herod has laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. In other words, he's saying, It is not in accordance with the law of Moses for you to be married to this woman. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head and a charger. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her, and he sent and beheaded John in prison. Here is a man who said, It is not lawful for you to be married to your brother's wife. I was sitting in a class several years ago, and there was a guy who was trying to defend what I would term as being unscriptural remarriages. And he said the main problem that John the Baptist had with this relationship was that it was incestuous. And I raised my hand in class and I said, can an incestuous relationship also be an adulterous one? And he said, yes. The logic is inescapable here. Regardless of how you take this passage, John was saying it is not biblical under the law of Moses for you to be married to this woman and he lost his head. I wonder how many sound preachers in our brotherhood are terminated from positions because they teach the truth on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Maybe they figuratively lose their heads. Some of you know I work with the National School of Preaching and I talk with these young men when they go and they try out at congregations and they come back and they tell me about their experiences. And I know of at least one young man who came to me and said, when I walked in the back door of that congregation, they handed me a list of topics and said, under no circumstances are you to preach on these topics. And in almost every one of those lists is the topic of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We don't want to hear this because it might mean that we have to change something or it might upset someone. Brethren, that does not change the truth because it makes you mad. I remember when I was a kid, my parents told me things that were truthful that would upset me, but they did it because they were trying to help me. It wasn't done out of hatred. It wasn't done out of anger. It was done because I needed to hear the truth 
because of how it would help me later on in life. We'll talk about that further in just a moment. And so number one, they, they think we're going we're gonna to test Jesus. We're going we're gonna to entrap him. We'll get him in trouble with the rabbis or we'll get him in trouble with the ruling officials because John the Immerser was just beheaded. But I think there's also a third potential here. That is, he could potentially become disfavorable among the people. We do not know the exact makeup of the multitudes that were following Jesus at that time, but it could very well have been that there were some who were in polygamous marriages. And it could very well have been that there were some who had been divorced at some point in their life. And so they really believe that they've trapped Jesus. We've got him caught. We've outsmarted him. He's going to get trapped in his words. He's going to get in trouble, and he will lose favor among the people, or at least with a portion of the people. But Jesus launches into this discussion of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And he starts off in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? Now I have that word read underlined in this passage because our Savior always appealed to Scripture. The opinions of men do not matter when they contradict God's Word. They do not matter. I was dealing with a couple several years ago. We were in the middle of a Bible study. And for whatever reason, the question of their marital situation emerged. And I told them, based on what you've described here, we need to have a deeper study on marriage, divorce, and remarriage before we can go any further in this Bible study. The Bible study ended immediately. They traveled to a Christian bookstore, and they found several authors they used the term pastors from churches of Christ who had written on the topic of marriage, divorce, and remarriage and had, had arrived at vastly different conclusions than the one that I was sharing with them. Brethren, there are not 10 or 15 different versions of the truth. There's just one version, and that's God's version. And my opinion on the topic does not matter. What matters is what is rooted and grounded in God's Word. In the beginning... God created them and made them male and female and said for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together let not man put asunder. Throughout this entire discourse Jesus wants to restore the original plan of God for marriage. In the beginning, marriage was heterosexual and monogamous. I don't care what the Supreme Court has said. I don't care what any individual says. That is what marriage was defined as in the book of Genesis. It was between a man and a woman, and it was not polygamous in nature. In other words, Adam did not have five or six different wives, and Eve did not have four or five different husbands. That's what marriage was like in the very beginning. And as a matter of fact, there was no divorce in the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine Adam going to a court of law and saying, Your Honor, I want to divorce this woman because she has caused my work to be so very difficult. She gave me that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and everything was going fine. And then when I partook of it, God found out about it. And, and then everything became just out of control in my life. And I want to divorce this woman. But you don't find that anywhere in the book of Genesis. There was no such thing as divorce. As a matter of fact, you do not read about it until as late as the book of Leviticus. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 25, this is what happened in regards to the marriage of man and woman. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, and made a rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. You have one man for one woman. It was heterosexual. It was monogamous in nature. And Jesus is trying to restore the original intent of God as it pertains to marriage. And that should be our intent as well because it was the intent of the Master in Matthew 19. And so they reason with him further or tempt him further, if you will. 
In Matthew 19, 7 through 8, they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put your wives away, but from the beginning it was not so. Here he goes back to the original intention of God as it pertained to marriage. One man, one woman, no divorce. And so this idea, this handwriting of divorcement, we need to acknowledge that it was intended as a legal instrument. And this is what is said in Deuteronomy, and this is one of the passages that our Savior is, that these men, that these rabbis are alluding to. This is what Moses wrote. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, a legal instrument, okay? And give it her hand and send it out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife from her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. This is basically the passage that they are talking about. And so Jesus clarifies this. This legal instrument was intended to be a source of protection for the woman who is being put out by her husband. Find that the law of Moses varied greatly from the ancient Near Eastern law codes that existed among the Canaanite peoples. It was very different. A woman who lived in a Canaanite society, she might very well be in a situation where her husband decided that he wanted to divorce her. But that did not offer her any sort of legal recourse where she could subsequently be remarried or in some cases even return to her home. She was seen perhaps as being a liability in some setting. But the law of Moses allowed the husband to give the wife a handwriting of divorcement. And as a result of that handwriting of divorcement, she could subsequently be remarried or she could, in fact, go back to her family of origin. Now, in other ancient Near Eastern civilizations, and that's what that abbreviation stands for, A-N-E, this could very well have been a death sentence for a woman and for any children that might have been produced as a result of that marriage. Jesus said, because of the hardness of your hearts, God knew that you would be so hardened toward the wife of your youth that you would have this desire to put her away, and God knew that this could potentially be a death sentence. So we have this legal instrument that allows her to perhaps survive the fallout of a divorce in the society that they lived in. We have a lot of people today who have hardened hearts when it comes to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. If you sat in some of the counseling situations that I have sat in, or some of my friends have sat in, or they have worked with someone who has been devastated by a divorce and had them weep in the counseling office and beg and plead with a mate to stop committing adultery and to come back and once again be faithful so that they can save their marriage, save their family, save their children, you would understand why we need to have a soft heart on this topic. And I think if you sat in some of those settings, you would understand why God's marriage law is stated as it is. Because God understands the devastation that goes along with the decision to divorce from one's spouse. Under the law of Moses, this legal instrument was given for the protection of women and children because God knew what it was that they were going to do. And so we arrive at Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. Brethren, I tell you, just about every word in that passage has been debated in some fashion or another. But I will sit down and I will talk with people when they have questions on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And I will ask them, please read Matthew 19, 9. Will you explain to me what it says? And without exception, when they read through it, they arrive at the biblical conclusion. But then they say, well, I need to study about this. I'm not sure that I, I agree with that. And I tell people, I tell the young preachers who come through the school of preaching, you better decide what you believe in regards to marriage, divorce, and remarriage because you're going to have a question 
Somebody's going to come to you and they're going to say, well, I want you to marry me, but I'm in my second, third, or maybe even fourth marriage. Will you marry us, given the circumstances? And I say this to the brethren as well. You'd better decide what this passage means. Because at some point in your life, you're going to have a family member or a friend, a, a brother, a son, a daughter, who's going to have marital difficulty. And maybe at one time you were very sound in regards to what this passage taught. But then you step back and say, I better think about this. I better really study and dig in and decide what this means. If you wait until that point arrives, then you've probably made a mistake. You better decide what this states before you arrive in this situation or your family members arrive in this situation. Because God's law applies equally to all people. It doesn't matter about the familial relationship or the friendship that you have with that person. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 9, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now that word, whosoever, that word includes saint and sinner alike. I have read various opinions where people have tried to say that the alien sinner is not under God's marriage law. Their argument is this. A man marries early in life, and he and his first wife, they, they simply don't get along, and as a result of having so many disagreements, they decide to divorce. Five or ten years later, he falls in love with this woman. They marry, and then maybe they attend an assembly of the Lord's people. And they learn through the teaching of God's word that they need to obey the gospel. But a part of obedience to the gospel is they have to repent, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And so they try to determine what repentance in that situation means. And some have falsely taught that an alien sinner is okay because they did not know God's marriage law and as a result were not amenable to it, okay? Now that word whosoever in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9 is the exact same Greek word that is used in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have life everlasting. Now you tell me why John 3.16, who uses that exact same word, applies to everybody, but Matthew 19.9 does not. And the answer is, it is a logical fallacy to conclude that the alien sinner is not under God's marriage law. Part of my question is, why that law only? Why is it just that one? Surely there would be other laws that would not apply to someone who's an alien sinner by virtue of the fact that they didn't know that. Please name another one. But it always falls at this passage, at this location in the Scripture. The point is, the alien sinner is under God's marriage law. That's hard for a lot of people to swallow. Had a gentleman who was a deacon at a congregation that I preached for for a while. I was going through 1 Corinthians 7, and he stood up in the middle of the class and said, I don't agree, I don't think the alien sinner is not under, I, I believe the alien sinner is not under God's marriage law. And I knew there was something in his past. I knew by the way he was acting before we ever got to that passage in 1 Corinthians 7. God's marriage law applies. If there is a law that does not apply, would we not be better not to teach the gospel at all? Have you ever thought about it that way? If ignorance means that I'm saved and I'm okay, why don't we allow people to remain blissfully ignorant instead of teaching the truth? And the answer is we teach the truth because we know without the truth, people are going to be lost, period. Jesus says, except it be for fornication. I have that word underlined there. So the Greek term for fornication is pornea. And it has various definitions, but here are some. Harlotry, including adultery and incest. Also defined as sexual immorality. It would also include acts of homosexuality. In other words, when a person who is married engages in an act of sexual immorality with another person, they have created a situation where the innocent party may very well choose to put them away because of their sexual immorality. That's what the passage means. Okay. What about the word adultery? What exactly does that mean? Well, that, this word has been hotly debated in our brotherhood throughout the years. I want you to remember this single rule of interpretation. 
And it will help you with Matthew 19. It will help you with just about everything that you study in God's Word. And this rule of interpretation is the literal is preferred over the figurative unless context demands otherwise. The literal is preferred over the figurative unless context demands otherwise. Now the Greek term for adultery in this passage is moikaio. And it literally means every time a couple who is unscripturally married have intimate relations, they are in fact committing adultery. That's the idea. Now notice the wording in the King James translation. It literally says committeth adultery. And that ETH ending in the King James translation, I think that is, that is something really good that is done in that translation because it lets us know that that is an ongoing action. There are some actions that are punctiliar in nature, meaning point action. They occur once. And then there are some actions that are linear. That means that they are ongoing. And the nature of this word, the way that it's used, the tense, the way that it appears in the text lets me know that this is an ongoing action, that every time someone engages in intimate relations who are not scripturally married, they are guilty of committing adultery. That's the idea that's put forth here. Now, the word adultery has been misused in many different contexts. There are those who tried to make the argument that the word adultery literally means covenant breaking. And you find that used figuratively in various places in the Old and New Testament. But remember our rule of interpretation? That the literal is preferred over the figurative unless context demands otherwise. And so you do find passages in the Old Testament where it talks about the nation of Israel figuratively committing adultery against God by going out and following after pagan and strange idol gods. But that is not what is being said here. There are those who make the argument that all you've got to do is repent of covenant breaking and then you're okay. But that's not what is being said here. This adultery, the way that's used in this passage, refers to sexual sin. In John the 8th chapter, the woman who's taken in the act of adultery, the text says, in the very act. Now, was she in the act of covenant breaking or was she in the act of being sexually immoral with another man? And I think we know the answer to that. She was in the act of being sexually immoral. She wasn't in the act of covenant breaking. So this is an ongoing thing. If they are living in adultery. Now that phrase is not found anywhere in scripture. Living in adultery. But the concept is still there. And so after Jesus goes through Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. His disciples say unto him. If the case of the man be so with his wife. It is good not to marry. Now the disciples understood the implication of this passage. And in our day and age we say that's a very hard topic to preach through or a very hard topic to teach. But I think it was very difficult in the age that Jesus lived in and this passage tells me that it was. So you have a situation where a couple says based on what you've taught in regards to Matthew 19 and verse 9 we are quote living in adultery. So what does a couple do if they are living in this situation? Well, repentance means you've got to stop committing adultery. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Now that phrase that I have emboldened, and I have the word were underlined, tells me that they repented of those sins. The phrase, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, that phrase meant that they repented of homosexual acts. That's what it means. They stopped living their lives after the manner of sins that are listed here. They stopped stealing. They stopped being covetous. They stopped being drunkards. They stopped being parties, partiers or revelers. But you are washed. That phrase means that they were baptized. But you are sanctified. They are set aside as being a holy possession of God. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and the, by the Spirit of our God. Now I want to ask you a question. 
We have this entire list of sins that Paul deals with in this passage. And a lot of people say, well, it's very hard for me to understand if I'm living in adultery, maybe there are children involved, it's very hard for me to understand that I have to stop living in this situation. You can't possibly mean that I've got to separate from myself from this man or this woman and not enjoy intimate relations ever again in our lives. Well, I want to ask you this question. Let's say this morning that somebody responds to the invitation. A man who came in. I don't know a thing about this man. He comes in and he responds to the invitation. And if you need to respond in just a moment, we want you to, to, to do that. But he responds. He comes down to the front. He sits right here. I sit down beside him. He says, you know, you had an excellent lesson and I want to be immersed. I want to become a child of God. And I say, that's great. And then all of a sudden, another man gets up from the back, walks down to the front, and sits on the other side of me. And I, said, and I say to this man, sir, I'm glad you've come forward too. Are you wanting to be baptized this morning? He says, no, I'm just down here to support my husband. And I say, wait a minute. Are you saying that you two men are married? Well, yeah, I mean, the Supreme Court says it's fine. We were married three weeks ago. We love each other. Well, I'm sorry, but based on what you've told me, I can't baptize you until you understand you cannot be in a homosexual relationship, practicing homosexual relationship with this man. You've got to stop doing that or your baptism will not be valid. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And the man who comes forward says, I love this man so much. He's my husband. I can't do that. Now, what reasonable person would make the argument that I should go ahead and baptize that man if he is living in a homosexual marriage, practicing homosexual acts with another man? Nobody who understands what Scripture teaches about homosexual behaviors. Nobody. So you tell me, what's the difference between doing that versus baptizing any person? who is unwilling to repent of a sin that exists in their life. Somebody comes forward and they're a thief. They are, they're known. They're notorious. We have, we have police officers in the auditorium this morning. And this guy's been arrested by one of our police officers ten times for car theft. And he comes forward and everybody's rejoicing. And I say, you want to be baptized? He says, yeah, I want to be baptized, but i got to let you know, I earn my living by stealing cars, and I can't stop doing that because that's how I make my way through life. I'd say to that man, well, wait a minute here. You've got to stop stealing cars before I can immerse you. you. You understand that, right? And he would have to stop if it was, in fact, a genuine conversion to Christ. So some still ask, does God really require this? Does God really require the disillusionment of a family? We have this passage in Ezra chapter 10, verses 9 through 12. It says, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month, on the twentieth day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. Someone asked me several years ago, name one of the saddest passages anywhere in God's Word, and I named this passage. Because you have these people who realize they have violated God's Word by marrying women and men of the land. They had intermarried with these Canaanite peoples, which was a violation of God's law. And here they are realizing that they violated God's law and they're sitting in this pouring rain and they're shivering and they're trembling because they physically, they, they're probably very sick in addition to being rained on and realizing that God's not happy with them. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, You have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. Now, brethren, this is an Old Testament passage, but the principle still remains. You cannot maintain any sinful relationship, whatever it is, and think God is okay with that. I would never stand here before you this morning and say that this is easy. In regards to controversial sermons that I've preached in 30 years of preaching, marriage, divorce, and remarriage would be number one. Number two would most likely be me encouraging Christians 
to date and marry other faithful Christians. Number three would probably be contribution over the years. But this is the number one most controversial sermon that I've ever preached in my preaching career. As a result, it is one of the most studied topics that I have considered over 30 years of preaching. I would never stand here and say, this is simple. When you're talking about families, maybe in some cases, men and women who've been married 20, 30, 40 years, who realize they're living in adultery and something must be done so that they stop having this adulterous relationship. It could be very well be as simple as them saying, we're not going to engage in intimate relations anymore. Several years ago, Hugo McCord had studied with an older couple and through the course of study, he learned that they were living in what I would term as being an unscriptural marital situation. They were an older couple. They had been married for many years. They had children. They had grandchildren. Brother McCord told them correctly that the term adultery in Matthew 19 refers to sexual sin, that they could continue to cohabitate in the same situation, but they could not engage in intimate activity, and that would be the repentance that would be required. I agree with that conclusion. And the reason I agree with it is because what Jesus says in Matthew 19, 11 through 12. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save to them who it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now that phrase that I have underlined there tells me that Jesus understands and we need to understand that it might very well be that we have to give our, up our right to enjoy intimate pleasure to be subjects of the kingdom because he said once again and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake again I would never argue that this is easy but the Bible says that we're to take up our cross daily and follow after Jesus and if that means I have to give up intimate relations with my wife so that I'm not committing adultery then that is in fact the case Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 through 6. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. This is a highly emotional topic. I had mentioned last week that my father was divorced from his first wife. They had been married for 20 years, and he divorced as a result of some of the things that were going on in the marriage. About three or four years later, he met and married my mother. You will hear me deliver sermons over human pain and suffering, and you will learn when I get to that point in my sermon deliveries that I admire my father very much. If I had to name one man who had the most influence over me throughout my entire life, it would be my father. I miss him very deeply, very badly. I love and miss my mother, but in all honesty, I was closer to my dad. I knew my father had been divorced. And one day, it took all the courage that I could summon. But I looked at my father and I said, Are you in a scriptural marriage with my mother? He said, Yes. He said, My first wife ran around on me. She cheated. She committed adultery. I met and married your mom. Years later, I met the sound, faithful gospel preacher who married them. And I said, were my parents in a scriptural marriage? He said, yes. Your father and your mother and his former wife all worked at the same place, and I worked there with them. People would come, and they would talk in front of me, not knowing that I had a relationship with your father and his former wife, and they revealed the fact that she was committing adultery. He says, when I married your mom and dad, I know that your father had the right to remarry. My mother had never been married. It took all the intestinal strength that I had to confront my father with that. And I confronted him with it because I loved him, still loved him. And I'm sharing the truth with you about Matthew chapter 19 because I love you. It would be so much easier to stand up and preach sermons where we tell lies and feed people candy and everybody leaves feeling great. Everything's good. No problems at all. But that type of preaching does not save souls. It doesn't. We need to teach the truth. 
And one of the reasons why I talk about this topic is because we've got young people who are either about to get married or who are contemplating marriage. And they will have to decide one day whether or not they're going to tough it out, work through their marital problems, or just divorce for any reason whatsoever. And even in cases where there is fornication, there is the opportunity to perhaps get the party who has been violated to forgive. That provision is given in Matthew 19, except it be for fornication, that is, if a mate cheats, the one who is totally innocent is free to subsequently divorce and remarry. But the one who is guilty of fornicating, being sexually immoral, they are never free to remarry according to God's marriage law. I said that to my dad because I wanted to make sure that he and my mother were in heaven one day. I didn't say it to him because I wanted to hurt his feelings or make him mad or, you know, I, I, I loved the man. I wanted to make sure he was right in the eyes of God. That's why we preach on the hard topics. Not because they're a lot of fun, but because we're trying to get people to heaven. That's our goal. That's why we're here. That's what we're doing. This morning, if you're not a child of God, if you've not been immersed for the remission of your sins, we want you to do that. Baptism saves, 1 Peter 3.21. Or it could be that you've become unfaithful and wandered away from God's people, from His church. If that's the case, we want you to repent of whatever is wrong in your life and asking for the prayers of this body of believers, you can be restored back into the fold of safety. This morning, if you are subject to the invitation, please come forward as we stand and as we sing this song of encouragement.